just want to take a moment, you can see the picture up there, um, to point out two things. Um, this was shot on my iPhone 6, so number one. <laughs> and number two, you can notice it's under uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. This was a um, trip that the Maternal Fetal Medicine Group does. They go out on a sailboat, sounds really romantic, everybody drinks wine, <coughs> has cheese. And so I, of course, was invited as part of the member of the MFM group. And I was excited to go with the one exception that I get terribly seasick. So as everybody was drinking wine, <clears throat> I sat there and sipped my water and ate carrot sticks until we got to this point and was able to take the picture. So I felt like it was a true success on the trip. So let's talk, no disclosures. I'm gonna just review um, some of the advanced techniques that we have for vaginal delivery and where we can be um, very much involved in that and go over the various um, roles that we play. So I always say to the residents and our fellows that obstetrics is predictably unpredictable. And you can see there the various things that can happen. Um, and I'm gonna turn my attention right now to the labor dystocia, which I talked a little bit about and set the stage yesterday. So labor dystocia, we're gonna focus on this particular arrest of dissent. And so when I describe this to our residents and fellows, I always say there's you know, an option if you're gonna do an operative vaginal delivery, and we'll talk about how the obstetrician assesses that. But they, if they decide they are in fact going to do a assisted delivery, they have to, there's the rules of engagement, I call it. So you pick your weapon and it's forceps or vacuum. You can't interchange between the two and you decide, there's various criteria which we'll kind of talk about if this is actually a possibility. So <clears throat> when you do that, the first thing that the obstetrician is going to do is they're going to check position. And so you can see there, um, just to point out a couple key things, um, the transverse position, whether it's occiput transverse, um, right or left, is not going to happen. So ideally, you know, if they have that situation, we're all going to be heading to the big white room and doing a C-section in that situation. So there's two different ways they could either do it occiput anterior, occiput posterior, and obviously the degrees that uh, the, the neonate is facing. It depends on how, what, they're, what instrument they're going to choose and then um, if they're even going to do it. So the other thing that they're evaluating and is important for us to know is, is this even a possibility because is the, the neonatal head engaged low enough? And so that's important and it's something that I always have our team look at when a patient's in the second stage and they've been pushing for a while and as I mentioned yesterday, we're going to let patients push longer, but we also want to know is this patient low enough that they can do an assisted delivery? And so there's certain criteria that they have to look at and they're assessing. So not just the position, but they're also assessing how low, what the station is. And so, oops, let's go back there. Um, it looks like, you know, we have here from minus three all the way to plus three, plus five is delivery. So the modern obstetrician, if they're gonna do an assisted delivery, is really not going to attempt it unless they're plus two or lower. And so that's another rule of engagement. There are some uh, old time obstetricians that may do a mid forceps. Nobody is going to do a high forceps now. That is just not um, a part of the ACOG criteria. But I will say generally, you're not going to find an obstetrician practicing in modern day that doesn't do one that's, that's unless it's plus two or lower. So that's the other part that they're going to look at. And that's important for us to know because we're gonna be involved in that situation when they're doing the assisted delivery or if it fails. It's important that we're there for both of those. So the criteria, this is sort of outlined here. This actually can be utilized for both the vacuum or the forceps. And I would say by show of hands, how many people have seen, your institution, are you guys doing forceps? Do you see the? Great, actually, it's good to see. And so the rest, I assume, are doing va only vacuums, right? So forceps is, a, is been a dying art, and so I'm glad with the show of hands that people are doing them, because it's actually a, it's, I have to say, in being both an OB and an anesthesiologist, my two favorite procedures were both the forceps and an epidural placement. So the forceps, I think, uh, can do a lot as far as lowering our C-section. 
rates, um, and I, I think you know it's it's nice to see that people are still doing it. Um, it's one of the things that we train um, our obstetricians and our maternal fetal medicine specialists in doing. So you can see there the key um, criteria that we need to have for the forceps. But one of the other concerns that I want to bring up is, as I mentioned, there's different positions. So occiput anterior, whether you're shifted left or right, is is um, an easier pull, if you will. So whether you're doing a vacuum or forceps. When you have a patient who is OP, and you will notice this and have seen it, they tend to have more back pain, they're uh, pushing longer, and so I often, when I see that happening and I look at the labor board and think, this patient's been pushing for a while, we've gotten um, called for back pain, I ask the obstetrician, is this position, is the, is the baby's head OP? And oftentimes it is. And I, the next question I have is, if it's low enough, are you, going to, are you willing to pull? And the reason for that is because we tend to see high rates of dystocia and failed operative delivery. And I'm going to show you in the next couple slides that the um, high uh, failed operative delivery is a much more um, morbid procedure when you then have to go to C-section. The other part is you can have higher perineal lacerations and the neonatal outcomes are worse. It's a hard pull. Having done them myself, it is probably the hardest pull that um, the obstetrician will have if they're doing a uh, forceps delivery on an OP kiddo. So here's the slide <clears throat> that um, we look at that kind of points out a couple key things. Number one, the reason why you don't do vacuum and forceps. You pick one, if it works, great. If not, you throw in the towel and you go get a suction, move on don't switch instruments. There's higher neonatal morbidity with that. The other thing I want to point out is cesarean, okay, cesarean delivery after a forceps and vacuum has a much higher risk of neo poor neonatal outcomes. So that's what the obstetrician is doing when they're deciding they're saying, am I, am I gonna risk this? I know if I fail doing this operative delivery that the cesarean delivery is gonna be more complicated. And we talked about the morbidity that you see with a second stage cesarean delivery. It's a much more morbid, it's even more morbid procedure when you then have someone that has, the obstetrician has pulled and then failed to do it. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're setting up the room and thinking about, did this, is this gonna be successful? And if it's not, what are my plans for the C-section? Am I gonna call for blood? Am I gonna have a second IV? Those are the things to think about. And in those situations, those are cases where I definitely have the blood available in the room and I, and I put in um, more IV access if we then have to go to section because the operative delivery failed. So one thing I'm gonna bring up now is episiotomies. So hopefully you guys are not um, at an institution where people are routinely doing episiotomies because that's been shown through several studies that routine episiotomies are actually more, um, more complications are seen with more significant severe tears, fourth degrees, third degrees. So it's not something that we routinely do. However, if you're doing a um, urgent delivery, there's a fetal bradycardia, they're um, on the perineum and they need to cut an episiotomy, that's reasonable. If you're doing a forceps or if you have a shoulder dystocia, and we'll talk about that in a moment, then oftentimes you know, there's, that's an indication for an episiotomy. One of the things that um, we do when we're doing our forceps and we're having, we, we think we can deliver from below, maybe there's a fetal bradycardia, our obstetricians are doing medial lateral episiotomies. And so I bring this up because it's very important to look, there's, I've sort of outlined the comparison contrast between the two. And an important thing to know is this, I've highlighted extensions. So obviously it looks like the midline would be the better way to go with minimal post-op pain, um, rare issues with healing, but they are more commonly associated with extensions of the perineal laceration. So we're trying to avoid the third degrees, the fourth degrees. Extensions are uncommon, but in the medial lateral, but more commonly have pain. So with those patients, whenever there's an episiotomy that's cut, we ask, did you cut an apes and was it a medial lateral? And then for those patients, we would give Duramorph through the epidural because of the more increased pain. 
So let's talk about the perineal episiotomies. So this picture, just for your reference, so obviously these are the ones that we're trying to avoid. And the big uh, deal with the, the um, medial lateral, this isn't, it, it would basically go into the um, perineal muscle at almost the nine o'clock position. And we wanna obviously avoid these, the fourth degree and the third degree. So if it's a fourth degree tear, again, those are other situations where we would give uh, Duramorph. And those are where we will take the patient from the labor suite into the OR and they have to do a more significant repair. It takes longer. We're actually gonna be involved in that, in that uh, anesthesia for that case. So I'm gonna turn our attention now to the shoulder dystocia. I describe that um, as the obstetrician's difficult airway. It is the most terrifying experience uh, for any obstetrician. And the worst part about it is we, we are not very good at predicting who ends up um, having a shoulder dystocia. So an example of this is when um, in my obstetric training, we spend six weeks at Kaiser Honolulu. I know it's rough, but we have to spend six weeks there. And there we have a large Samoan population. So we would go there as you know, the UCSF residents and we are used to not you know, seeing everybody's thin, they exercise in San Francisco. So we're like, all right, we go to Hawaii and we see these very large Samoan women and everybody has taped up on their labor room, shoulder precautions, shoulder precautions. So we go in there, we're all ready, you know, this is gonna be a shoulder, these babies fly out. So. We, we are so bad at predicting. We think, oh, she's got diabetes, poorly controlled. The kids fly out. They're 14 pounds, but they're not struggling. They're flying out. <laughs> so we're really, we're really bad. And, and that's the reason why it's so terrifying for us. So we have criteria that we should not be doing an elective induction for a patient with suspected macrosomia. Um, you can see the, the issues there, partly because when we look at estimated fetal weight in the third trimester, we are off by an error of plus or minus three weeks. So there's no sense in us sectioning someone if we think that they're macrosomic, unless they fall under the estimated fetal weight of greater than 5,000 for a non-diabetic woman and greater than 4,500 for a diabetic woman. Other than that, we shouldn't be doing those elective C-sections. So having said that, I'm gonna go through a series of maneuvers that we do. And the reason that I'm going through this is because we as anesthesiologists can be there to help with some of those maneuvers. And we also wanna be there for the issues that come up if we failed. So here's the McRoberts. Everybody has sort of gone through these. McRoberts, super pubic pressure. I would say I'm gonna show you a paper that was um, done where they looked at retrospectively what was successful. McRoberts maneuver with super pubic pressure is very successful. It's, it's been one of those things that it's the go-to. The next thing is the posterior shoulder, which actually um, a lot of people think about down the road, but I've put it second because I'm gonna tell you that it's actually the second most successful um, type of um, maneuver that you can do for a shoulder dystocia. Sorry, there it is. So it actually um, is quite um, brilliant because what's stuck is the anterior shoulder on the pubic bone, right? So what you do is you reach in and grab the posterior shoulder and that drops the anterior shoulder. The next is the wood screw, which um, everybody has sort of seen that and heard about that. And then the Rubin maneuver. This was the study that looked at, it was basically over 200,000 deliveries and little over 2,000 had shoulder dystocias. I'm gonna tell you that in that um, group, they had um, one Zavinelli maneuver, which I think everybody always hears about because it just sounds so you know, horrible. It's we fail, we push the kid back up, and then we run into a C-section. So only one of the, the two, over 2,000, little over 2,000 had the Zavinelli maneuver. And the, um, what this showed was the most successful was the McRoberts with super pubic pressure, but then your next go-to is the posterior shoulder maneuver. That showed less neonatal, um, poor neonatal outcomes and injury. And so, again, 
the posterior shoulder. So this is one um, actually that I've utilized myself in a situation when I was practicing it at Kaiser Walnut Creek. And it was the um, midwife had tried every single maneuver. She's a very skilled midwife. And I got the urgent call. We have a shoulder dystocia and I ran in and the one procedure that wasn't yet done, that maneuver, was, was the posterior shoulder. So I did that and cut a medial lateral appease and we delivered the, the kid. So, um, and then I uh, had a glass of wine because that was really stressful <laughs> after I was on call. <laughs> so um, so the, where anesthesia comes in for the management of shoulder dystocia is we need to provide epidural anesthesia. Perineal relaxation is the key to that. We can help with the maneuvers, and you know, where we can give super pubic pressure, we can hold a leg up, um, but we also need to be thinking about preparing for the emergency cesarean delivery if they can't get the kiddo out. And we also are, can be there for neonatal resuscitation and maternal resuscitation. Interestingly, there's not that many cases in the shoulder dystocia where you need to do that much maternal resuscitation. Of course, if you have to do the Zabinelli maneuver, and um, at my other uh, Santa Clara Valley when I was practicing my last year of OB, and I think this, between those two years, that was it for me, and I was ready to go to anesthesia. We had one Zabinelli that wasn't my case, but somebody else's did not end so well. Um, and so that, um, the Zabinelli maneuver, oftentimes if they're going to do it, you need to, it's basically pushing the head up and they will often call, the obstetricians will call for uterine relaxation, which we can give nitroglycerin, um, terbutaline, there's various other, um, which I'll talk a little bit about nitroglycerin in a moment, but we wanna be there for that. So now I'm gonna turn our attention to uh, the third stage of labor when we've got things like retained placenta. As I mentioned yesterday, we'll talk about you know, retained placenta and what we do with that. So risk factors obviously for, if you have a retained placenta are postpartum hemorrhage, um, preterm delivery is a risk factor for the retained placenta. The cord is tiny. In fact, the more preterm delivery there is, um, the smaller the cord. Uh, another risk factor, which I didn't list here, is an eager intern um, who pulls too hard and um, you know valses the cord. Um, we generally will let the uh, placenta go 30 minutes before we start to get anxious about it as long as there's not any hemorrhage. If there is, we're gonna manually extract it. And we may get called um, to help with this. Either they're going to do a banjo curatage or they're gonna do a manual extraction you know, just with their, their hand. So we need to be there um, to evaluate what blood loss has been there thus far, what further interventions they're going to be doing, make sure we've got IV access, blood products, and is the labor suite the right location? Maybe we need to be into the OR and we, can, we need to provide some anesthesia for that. And so again, you know, I've listed there kind of what our goal is, usually a T6, especially if they're gonna do a banjo curatage. So what is a banjo curatage? It is just that, that is the banjo. Um, it has a wide, you can see this wide area here, which they go and they scrape any residual um, tissue uh, with the goal of making sure that we're not called you know, two or three hours later for continued bleeding and hemorrhage. So the goal is get every bit of the placenta out. So nitroglycerin, I'm bringing this up here because it's quite ubiquitous. I, I think Brendan mentioned already using some nitroglycerin. We use it a fair bit um, in these next two situations. So one with the um, retained placenta and I'm gonna um, turn to the twin deliveries and I'll tell you where we use nitroglycerin in there. It's the beauty of it is it does provide uterine relaxation um, the dosing is unclear. Um, we're doing a study right now at UC on um, nitroglycerin and the dosing and using it for second stage C-sections. But the literature says anywhere from 25 to 250 mics per bolus. Um, we actually use more than that depending on the situation. It's short acting, so two to three minutes. And you can see all of the clinical uses that we have for it. Um, one study, there were several studies looking at, um, Cochran reviewed it, looking at the management for it with retained placenta. And actually, uh, the problem with most of the studies that they pointed out in the, in the Cochran review is that there, the preparation, whether it was given sublingual or IV, was very different depending on which studies, and the doses varied between the studies. 
but um, suffice to say there was, it did not alone using nitroglycerin did not reduce the ability to um, have to then go and manually extract the placenta. So it's not sort of a, a standalone, as in, you may still have to extract the placenta manually. So that was what the, the study was looking at. We use it also in uterine inversion. Um, that is something that is rare, but it is catastrophic. So we definitely see severe blood loss, shock, um, bradycardia. These are the risk factors that you see. Sadly, like most of the situations where I've had uterine inversion have actually been patients that were totally healthy, no risk. We, I mean, it's rare for us at UCSF to have a patient that's totally healthy, but you know, they are totally healthy until you know, then we have something like uterine inversion. And so that was our last case, a very healthy patient that we were all wondering what was she doing delivering at UCSF. And of course, she ended up having a uterine inversion, so there was our answer. But um, uterine inversion is just that, it inverts, and um, it's pretty profound um, uh, when it happens. Oftentimes, if a, a good obstetrician notices it, they will make a fist and quickly push it back in, and we won't even know about it. So if we're getting called, it's because they're in big trouble and they need help because they've already tried to reduce it and they couldn't. So in those situations, um, we need to think about the airway, it's making sure all the uterotonics are stopped, so make sure the Pitocin's off, call for blood products and get to the um, operating room. We can give nitroglycerin and I give a big bolus of it um, as their obstetrician is ready to replace the uterus with their fist, but if that doesn't work, then we turn to volatile anesthetics and you give a very high dose and eventually relaxes it. And then obviously at that point, once the uterus is um, replaced, you need to then start the uterotonics um, and resuscitate. So this brings me to our last topic, which is near and dear to me, which is a uh, vaginal delivery of the twin pregnancy. It is one of those situations where anest OB anesthesia and our um, obstetricians work together in a very concerted effort with you know, a team to deliver both twin A and twin B vaginally. The study was done actually looking at the um, results of doing a vaginal delivery versus an elective C-section. And it really um, kind of turned where many women were having these elective C-sections. And the big result from this actually was that there was no um, worse outcomes in neonatal or maternal for uh, doing a vaginal delivery. How, so that basically changed the way all the obstetricians thought about it and we're now offering more vaginal deliveries. The criteria though is clear. So if A and B are vertex, obviously you have the option for a vaginal delivery, realizing that B may flip in the middle of the delivery. If A is vertex and B is breech, you have the option for a vaginal delivery. But if both are breech, there's no option, it's cesarean delivery. If A is breech and B is vertex, still cesarean delivery. You also have to have less than 20% discordance between twin A and twin B, and you have to be greater than 28 weeks gestational age, and you can see the EFW there. The other key, key point, and I should highlight this, is you need to have an experienced obstetrician so that they're can they are comfortable doing breech extractions. So what we do is we have um, neuroaxial analgesia. We deliver in the operating room. Usually they'll let twin A push until they're just you know, low enough and you know, not quite crowning, obviously, but they get into the OR when they're ready to deliver. And it's a double setup. We have a double setup where we have the C-section uh, ready, all the instruments ready and counted. Um, and then we bring in the, the in family in there and you know, the, the deliverers there. There's an ultrasound. At the delivery of the first twin, the um, we have usually, it's obviously a resident is ultrasounding for twin B to see how twin B is coming down. And at that point we provide sacral anesthesia. We want, uh, it it's, can be uncomfortable, so we want to make sure that we have a nice dense block lower. And we also start to give nitroglycerin. And the key with the nitroglycerin, it needs to be given quite early, right when they're getting, before they even start to go in and once twin A is delivered. Because if the lower uterine segment contracts down, it's game over. 
we now have to switch and deliver B by C-section. And so our job is to completely relax that uterus as much as we can. The obstetrician reaches up and grabs um, the feet of the twin B and breaks the bag and does the breech maneuvers. Um, I sort of show our fellows the breech maneuvers and one of our fellows the, um, this year said I could, it could be a dance move, so I'm waiting for that to go on YouTube. Um, so the two things that we think about in um, the breech delivery is we worry about head entrapment and there's two maneuvers that we can do. Now the Marceau maneuver is a very common one um, and that's mainly because a lot of times people are not used to the Piper forceps and so um, we have the, uh, those are the two options there. Okay, I'm running out of time and thankfully I'm at my last slide. So um, this just illustrates, um, uh, hopefully in the, at the end you guys have realized that it's a teamwork. This is the end of the trip um, and you can see um, I, I did not get sick, but this is our whole group. We work together as a great team and I think we're, we're happy that uh, we all see eye to eye and know what each other needs. So thank you.